Welcome to Matthew Felix on Air, coming to you from San Francisco, California. People who create, people who make a difference. Hope you had a great couple of weeks. My main focus has been the release of my new book, Porcelain Travels. As those of you who watched or listened to recent episodes are well aware, Porcelain Travels chronicles horror, humor, and revelation in, on, and around toilets, tubs, and showers encountered on my travels. I am delighted to say that Porcelain Travels has been a number one new release in four Amazon categories, travel humor, literary travel, solo travel, and budget travel. It is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iBooks, and all the rest, so please help ensure that I have a career as a writer and go buy a copy of uh, Porcelain Travels, and that's in ebook and paperback. A couple of Mondays ago, on Monday, November 12th to be exact, Left Coast Writers threw me a launch party for Porcelain Travels, and it was so much fun. It was a packed house. The crowd was great. Uh, I was going to show you a video that uh, ab about that. There was just a 60-second 60 sec 60 video. I forgot to uh, to hook that up, but you can check that out on YouTube. Um, it was it was sort of like a sitcom. It was actually a really really fun event, and I couldn't have had more fun. So thanks to Left Coast Writers, thanks to Book Passage for hosting, and thanks to everyone who came out um, for the event. And like I said, videos the the whole event is on YouTube. There are also a couple of just three minute videos of a couple of the readings that I did. So you can check that out via my website, matthewfelix.com. My focus right now continues to be on getting Porcelain Travels out into the world. And, uh, but I should also mention that on Friday, December 7th, we will be having a, or I'll be part of an event at the Corte Mandera Book Passage that's focused specifically on Morocco. And uh, that event is being organized by author, filmmaker, and Lit Wings co-founder, not, not co-founder, Lit Wings founder, Aaron Byrne, who has uh, been on this show twice. And it's in honor of both of our books about Morocco, My With Open Arms, Short Stories of Misadventures in Morocco, and then Aaron's uh, anthology, which is called Vignettes and Postcards from Morocco. And it just so happens that my new book features two of the stories from my Morocco book, in addition to a third Morocco story that wasn't in the original Morocco book. So I'll be reading uh, one of the stories that's in both of the books, and that story is called A Turkish Bath in Morocco. And it's one of those stories that, uh, in hindsight, is really funny, but while I was living it, it was not funny at all, as I think I said in my video a couple of weeks ago when I was going through each of the stories in the book. But anyway, uh, not only will Aaron and I be participating in, the, in that event, but so will fellow writers Doug Cordell, Christina Amen, and Anna Elkins. And again, that's on December 7th at Book Passage in Corte Madera. And next Sunday, Aaron and Doug will be on the show to talk all about Morocco, which should be a lot of fun. Speaking of guests, the week after next, which is December 9th, I'll be doing my last show of the year before taking a break for the holidays, and Savani Babu will be on that show to talk about dark sky conservation, and I'm really excited about that because I think that's just such an interesting interesting movement, um, you know, protecting, protecting space, protecting sky from light pollution so that we can still see the stars and can still learn from, from what's going on out there and have a sense of our relationship to it. So I'm really looking forward to talking with Savani about that. She's also been on the show below before and um, we always have a lot of fun. So again, looking forward to that. Now though, what I'm looking forward to is talking all about coffee. And from a very early age, Willem Boot, my first, not my first guest, I don't know, I keep saying first and second, I don't know what's, what's going on here. But anyway, my guest today, Willem Boot, was intrigued by coffee. And he roasted his first batch at the age of 14. And after obtaining a master's degree in business economics at the University of Amsterdam, he co-owned his family's specialty coffee business in the Netherlands. When Willem moved to the United States in 1998, he founded Boot Coffee. Since then, he has advised coffee companies, coffee associations, development banks, and governments around the world. He has been a consultant on coffee quality programs in countries like Ethiopia, Colombia, and Honduras. And he has developed, uh, designed extensive marketing programs for coffee industries in Ethiopia and El Salvador. So clearly he gets around. In 2014, coffee from his farm in Panama won first place at the Best of Panama Coffee Competition. And in 2016, his coffees won multiple Good Food Awards in the United States. And I just had some of his coffee before the show, and I can now attest firsthand to the quality of his coffee. The only thing is I won't claim to be nearly as sophisticated or have nearly as sophisticated as a palate of a palate as he does, but um, the coffee was really, really good. And we're going to talk all about that, obviously. Uh, he is, did I already say this? I don't think so. So the coffee that we just had actually is from his farm in Panama, Finca la Cabra, and he helped 
I, at least I think it is, and he helped start a nearly 1,000-acre coffee farm in Ethiopia, Gesha Village Estate. Willem has extensive experience as a coffee roasting consultant and trainer, and he has written many articles about coffee roasting techniques in trade magazines. He has also educated hundreds of aspiring coffee professionals around the world. Last but certainly not least, William Willem started in 2016 his Boot Coffee Campus, a leading training institute located just north of San Francisco. Welcome, Willem. Thank you. <laughs> I'm honored. Uh, I'm honored to have you here. So we just met uh, a few weeks ago. You did a, an event with Dave Eggers to talk about his book, The Monka Mocha at Litquake. And uh, I didn't even know you were going to be there because actually someone else was supposed to be the protagonist of the story. Can you tell me his name again? Uh, Mokhtar Alkanchali. Right. So yeah. he was supposed to be there, couldn't make it. And you were there. And uh, I didn't know that I was going, you know, I'd wanted to have someone on the, on, on the show to talk about coffee for so long. And again, not even knowing you were there and so, going to be there. And so just listening to you talk about coffee and things, I was like, oh, I'd love to have him on the show. So you say you're honored. Well, trust me, I'm, I'm really honored. I was so excited when you said that you would be beyond today. So let's jump right into it. Um, you began coffee at the age of 14. So tell me about that. Yeah, so my my dad, who was my first teacher, my most important teacher yeah. in coffee and other things, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, he he had worked in coffee part of his life and uh, became um, very, um, I would say, disillusioned by commercial coffee uh -huh. in, in Holland. Right. Uh huh. Um, this was we were living at that time half an hour east from Amsterdam. Okay. And. Um, my dad had this idea, this crazy idea, to try to start a coffee revolution by promoting the idea that consumers should roast their own coffee at home. Right. And he came to a design for a coffee roasting machine that uh -huh. he named the Golden Coffee Box. Wow. And that machine... Which I've seen. Which I've yeah, seen. You've, you've yeah, you've seen. You brought it I to actually the uh, took it with event. Me yeah. to, the, um, to the event with uh, Dave Eggers. And, and that device, he was sure that consumers would grab onto this and that he would take the world of coffee by storm yes. with this amazing, shiny, <laughs> copper-looking <laughs> coffee roasting machine. Very proper-looking, yes. And obviously, he created a, a whirlwind, not a storm, but a whirlwind. And a lot of people started to uh, yeah, inquire about coffee but the machine didn't nearly sell as quickly as he had hoped to, but right. that led him to open a, a small, very small coffee roasting retail store in the town of Bayern. That's where I grew up. Okay. And that's when my, my own coffee career started. So I, I would come from high school, come from class, and then work a few afternoons per week in his uh, small uh, store. And yeah. that's, that's when I started roasting first okay yeah. did you drink coffee at the age of 14 because even I, in europe i don't think i started to did get you? i started to explore of course yeah because you know, you were exploratory I, you know, then and, yeah. and my <laughs> my father and my mother you know they they of course tried to yeah get me get me hooked and you know, the good part is that my coffee drinking experience started very differently from how it starts for most people because for most people the first cup of coffee is like not probably very very good yeah you don't normally like it the first time and you don't really like it and, yeah and i i don't even remember that i did disliked it yeah i i found it hard to comprehend as a beverage but i i really started taking a liking to it yeah okay and so don't remember exactly how when the first drink you had was or whatever but at what point did you start to really become enamored of it because it's one thing to uh, you know, your dad has this business and you, you work there after school and it's kind of, it's maybe sort of a curiosity, but it's, it's another to go a couple steps further and really become passionate about it. So what was it about coffee, do you think, that drew you in in that sense? Y you know, I think because my dad had a very peculiar approach to how to convert people to his coffees, right? Okay. And his approach was that every coffee, every coffee type um, matches a, a character, a, a persona, and like of a person of the person. corresponds and so like a very expressive coffee like you know coffees that have like a lush acidity like a vibrant acidity um, those coffees 
they can match persons that, for example, have yeah, strong, e expressive um, personas, like you know, artists, for example, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and I remember, of course, when I started to promote the coffees of my dad in his little store in the same way as, ha as he had been teaching me, of course, you know, those same people that I would try to turn on to that coffee, they wanted me also to drink it with them. Uh, uh -huh. And so yeah. we would, in the store, we would brew every, you know, half hour a, a different coffee. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, I had to also sip that coffee with that person right. to get their kind of their affirmation, their confirmation that what I was telling them was no bullshit. Right. right? And right. so, right. And you've got to like it if you want them to like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and Dutch people, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many Dutch people you've met in your life, but you know, they, they typically try to stay away from bullshit. Uh, and okay. so good. Yeah. Good. And that's so, a good trait for a culture. Yeah. I think we and, could use some of that in our culture. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a little more great. disdain for bullshit. Yeah. I think we could learn from the Dutch. Yeah. Okay, so slowly yeah. but surely, liking the coffee with your customers, you actually started liking it yourself yeah. and learning more about and it. And so I, I think well, maybe I was 15, 16 when I was like a sales clerk in my dad's store. Yeah. And th that basically meant that I was basically handed the keys of the store. <laughs> and right. Say, and I was told, you know, okay, now you, you run it for the next three hours. Yeah. And then, of course, my friends from high school, they would start exploring also what I was up to. Right. And, and obviously we were starting to drink coffee at that point. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. All right. So one thing I like to do before we go much further is um, when I have a show that's about a topic like this that I can actually do a little research on Wikipedia, I just like to look up some facts. So I just want to read a few quick facts that I found on Wikipedia. And you probably know all of these already. And undoubtedly much much more but for those of us who are I mean I drink coffee all the time and I drink specialty coffee but I don't know that much about it so I just thought I'd throw out a few facts and then um, and then we will continue so the genus coffee so this is all from Wikipedia so take it as as you may uh, the genus coffee is native to tropical Africa specifically having its origin in Ethiopia and Sudan and we're going to talk about that in a second uh, but it's native to tropical Africa Madagascar the Comoros Mauritius and Reunion in the Indian Ocean. Interesting that it's not in Latin America. I just sort of would have assumed there would be, you know, varieties that are indigenous. But this is there. Arabica that you're, yeah. This is Arabica that I'm talking about. Yeah. The, the species of Arabica. Okay. Are yeah. there indigenous species in Latin America yeah. of coffee? No, but there is yeah. also the species of Robusta. I know we're going to get to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hold yeah. on. Okay. Hold on over there. <laughs> okay. This is good. I like it when my guests are <laughs> eager. Okay. Um, okay, so coffee plants are now cultivated in over 70 countries, primarily in the equatorial regions of the Americas, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and Africa. The earliest credible evidence of coffee drinking appears in Yemen, in southern Arabia, in the middle of the 15th century in Sufi shrines. Sufis are the Muslim mystics, which is an oversimplification, but for those who aren't familiar with Sufis, that's kind of how they're often described. Uh, it was in Ar Arabia that coffee seeds were first roasted and brewed in a similar way to how we do it today. But the coffee seeds had to first be exported from East Africa to Yemen, again, which we'll talk about, as the coffee arabica plant is thought to have been indigenous to the former, to East Africa. Yemeni traders took coffee back to their homeland and began to cultivate the seed. By the 16th century, the drink had reached Persia, Turkey, and North Africa. From there, it spread to Europe and the rest of the world. And one of the things I thought was interesting was uh, initially in Christian Europe, there was some resistance because coffee was considered a, a Muslim drink. So some things never change or some things have roots way back in the past, I guess. Two main species of coffee are grown, Arabica and Robusta. Or robusta. I don't know. Do you say that kind of like Spanish? How do you say it? Just Robusta? Robusta. Right? Yeah. yeah, Robusta. Okay. Uh, Arabica coffee is generally is generally more highly regarded than Robusta coffee. Robusta tends to be bitter and have less flavor but better body than Arabica. For those reasons, about three quarters, and Willem, is, Willem has some opinion, opinions on this. Again, this is just Wikipedia. He's going to clarify for us. Uh, it's generally more highly regarded. Robusta tends to be bitter and have less flavor, but better body. I already spread that one. Uh, for these reasons, about three quarters of coffee cultivated worldwide is Arabica. Robusta strains also contain about 40 to 50% more caffeine. Consequently, this species is used as an inexpensive substitute for Arabica in many commercial coffee blends. However, good quality Robusta beans are used in traditional Italian espresso blends to provide a full body taste and a better foam head known as crema. Green unroasted coffee, and I'm almost done with this, 
is one of the most traded agricultural commodities, not, not surprising. As of 2016, Brazil was the leading grower of coffee beans, producing one third of the world total. And the last fact, yeah, this is almost the last fact. It's kind of the last fact. Coffee has become a vital cash crop for many developing countries, but this is the last fact I was referring to. And this is the one that really blew me away. And I'm curious about Willem's thoughts on this, whether this is you know on the, mar on the money or not. But according to Wikipedia, over 100 million people in developing countries, 100 million have become dependent on coffee as their primary source of income. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised by that. And that's yeah. directly and indirectly, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so coffee's a big deal, which of course we knew, but to me it's always interesting to sort of contextualize with some, some little facts there. Okay, so I kept qualifying twice during the, I qualified a few things, but two things I, or something I qualified twice was the origins of coffee. Because I think if I remember at the Dave Eggers talk, I think you expressed that there was some doubt. Again, Wikipedia is saying it's Ethiopia, but then there's question that maybe it actually did originate in Yemen. Do you have any thoughts on that or? No, so let's be clear about that. Okay, it, let's it, be clear. Ethiopia is a true birthplace. Okay, so there's no doubt about that. The Arabica species. Okay. Or Ethiopia and or South Sudan. Yeah. Okay, okay, and and then the robusta species originated in you know where is now uh, Congo or Uganda th that that part of Africa. Okay, yeah. Another question about what I just read, um, or no, I guess this is this is what you said during your talk. You said you talked about how the Dutch stole the first coffee seedling from Yemen. Now, can you tell us a little about that? A yeah, so you know the word. <laughs> Because <laughs> these are your people. I mean, I, what, what are and, your thoughts on that? And we, we really think of it that we borrowed. The that you borrowed okay. it. Have yeah. you taken it back yet? Uh, we're, we're, we're working we on that. We're working okay, on It's that, only been yeah. 500 years, yeah. so now would probably be a good time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but it was a penalty of death to take it out. Yeah. But, you know, as you know, as, as you probably know, in that time, the Dutch were fierce traders. And, yes. and we, we saw, you know, that there was potentially a good good opportunity to be developed economic opportunity um with coffee yeah a and at that time holland had colonies like indonesia right which um which became one of the first places in the world to to harbor many commercial farms that the dutch and entrepreneurs from holland started to develop okay yeah. now i couldn't help but notice again your dutch your coffee's long been your 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 family has long been in coffee is there some connection between that stolen seedling and your family? Do you want to come clean? I mean, I'm going to give you the chance here publicly to come clean on that. Is there, is there a connection, so, do you think? So I'm, I'm, I'm actually researching this. Oh, seriously? Yeah. You think you might actually be related to the initial coffee? Not to the initial, but I'm, I think one of my ancestors, his, uh -huh. his name was Justice Boot. Uh -huh. He was a vice admiral of the Dutch Navy. Okay. And... The Navy at that point had the task to also provide security to all the merchants right, right. and their vessels. Right. And, and very likely his ships were providing security to yeah, traders that sure. were sailing with their vessels to, you know, the port of Venice or to Istanbul or what used to be in Constantinople. Right. And, and very likely he <coughs> was directly involved with the coffee interesting yeah. so i was just joking but yeah. I, I actually stumbled upon yeah. something that could I, okay well we're gonna have to you're gonna have to come back when you find out the story i will if it turns yeah. out that you are actually part yeah. of that and we'll see if we can talk about reparations you might be able to make <laughs> and, and that sort of thing okay specialty coffee so we're going to talk about coffee today but specifically we're going to talk about specialty coffee right and it's probably a term that most of us are familiar with particularly given that it's, it's you know, it's just burgeoning today, the, the specialty coffee industry and all the cafes and things and the, and the specialty roasters. But how would you define it? What exactly is specialty coffee, just from your expert you know, perspective? I, there's a technical definition, which is the most boring one, right? Okay. But it's want, but don't, to, don't to bore you anyway for a little bit, all right? right? Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, yeah that was so, a great setup. So, so, yeah. there's a, <laughs> so there's a technical definition which goes into the number of defects that specialty coffee can have oh. and the underlying flavor notes, the attributes must be free of any of those taste defects that coffee can develop, right? Okay. And, so that's, and that gets very technical into how the coffee can be tasted and assessed visually and sensor in a sensorial way okay. in order to determine that. 
And there are people that learn how to do this effortlessly by becoming a so-called Q grader and they become like a sommelier of coffee and they learn the ins and outs of the technical part, right? Right, right. So that's, and that's if you are a coffee professional, like a technician, and you work in a lab, then becoming a Q grader, becoming a master of this theoretical part is, is really essential for your career. Right, it's legit in that actual yeah, context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you, know, if you now look, you know, at the experience part of specialty coffee, then it's really a beverage that can entice you by an array of flavor attributes that are aroma driven and taste driven. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's going on, that you have a, a unique flavor experience that is like the true expression of what the producer has been doing in his or her form. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You talked about, Again, specific to, to, to specialty coffee, you talked about three waves in, yeah. your, in your talk. So what, what are the three waves of specialty coffee? You know, the, the first wave, um, you could also call that the first wave of coffee, okay. was in post-war, World War II era, when coffee was really being discovered as a, as a beverage of choice, right? Okay. So it wasn't necessarily specialty yet at it that point. It was on its way to become something that was... Um, was sought after by consumers for the reasons that I just out outlined, right? For, for having a true flavor experience. Okay. And during that first wave, coffee you know, had a, had its heydays. And then also because of commercial interests and big companies coming up in the 1960s and 70s who started to roast and package in massive quantities, the quality started to glide down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, the second wave of specialty coffee now started with pioneers like here in the bay area we had alfred pete and in holland we had my my dad and in la you had herbert hyman and here in san francisco you had a legendary coffee trainer by the name trainer by the name of uh, erna knutsen a remarkable woman from norway and and they were truly pioneers in their way because they started to do everything different from where the big commercial companies had been screwing up quality mm -hmm. from from yeah, f a very fundamental level, right? So what's one and thing that they did differently, just to give an example? By buying what they found to be the best possible quality beans okay. mm -hmm. and by roasting them meticulously in small batches okay. yep. and by offering the coffee fresh. Yep. And so you know, best beans, small batches, and then freshly roasted, those became became the hallmark features of the, the, the third wave of yep. uh, coffee, of, uh, of specialty coffee. Okay. And my dad started in that same era, right? In the early 70s. And that's where, not, of course, my first memories of coffee go back to that I still hear in my mind the sounds of the little golden coffee box roasters that my mad dad made and uh -huh. that I was roasting samples with. Uh -huh. And then... The second wave of specialty also gave us, you know, companies, as I mentioned, Pete's Coffee and Starbucks and, and other, you know, main that we know and recognize. specialty players that are now kind of the new normal of coffee. Yep. Um, and then third wave really gave us a, a new set of companies and entrepreneurs, people that really took coffee to a smaller, small scale level. And they also became much more interested in understanding who the producers were behind those coffees, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the third wave of specialty coffee has given us a lot of companies. Like here in San Francisco, we, we have, you know, companies Ritual. Right, like Ritual Blue Bottle. and Blue Bottle and, you know, relatively originally companies that were set up in a artisan craftsman style way of roasting and purveying coffee who have now also been growing tremendously and but the interesting part and the good part of the third wave is that the story and the voice of the producer now was being featured more than ever before mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um and and that third wave also has given us part of yeah what what some coffee professional call the hipster generation of <laughs> coffee professionals right? right 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 and 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 that generation um is intricately connected with this third wave that is now slowly going into the fourth wave. Also. Okay, yeah. which is a nice transition for my next question because she's ikki sene Istanbul da kaldınız ve Istanbul'da ne yapıyordunuz? Do you understand? 
Uh, <laughs> so you spent I two years no in clue. Istanbul. Okay, you spent two years in Istanbul. So that's my limited Turkish. Um, but but it was interesting to me why you went to Istanbul. So why did you go to Istanbul? Me. Didn't personally. you go to Istanbul for two years? I was not in Istanbul for two years. Yeah. Wait, I, who was in Istanbul for two years? I read an article. I thought it was I, you. And I, you came back. I, I read your blog. I actually, I actually have... Um, Visited Istanbul many times, but I have not been there for because two years. Because it said, I read, I read a blog article where you moved to, does someone else write your blog articles? I'm not even aware. You don't even know what blog article I'm talking about. And, Interesting. And maybe <laughs> maybe that you read a blog by an ex-employee of mine. That's what I'm wondering, in, but yeah. it just has you at the bottom. Okay, because this was talking about someone who moved to Istanbul in 2005, came back in 2007, and how they had seen... This yeah. this kind of uh, specialty coffee start to take root there. Yeah, so I don't. And you have no idea. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, I don't you need to credit I, your authors on your blog posts. I don't recollect yeah. having lived <laughs> okay. Istanbul. Okay, well, if you forgot, then we'll have to talk about that. All right, but anyway, but my the point of bringing that up, besides yeah. you know using my Turkish publicly again, my super limited Turkish, is the fact that it's not just happening here. Yeah, right. It's happening overseas. But but another question I have is. I spend a fair amount of time in Spain and France, and I don't really see it happening there. So how much of this is going on in Europe? Because it's happening here everywhere, you know, the, obviously. Europe, but I do have an interesting anecdote about okay. my, my first travel, my first trip to Turkey. Okay. okay. Uh, but, but first to answer <laughs> your question. Yeah. So why do things happen in Europe slower than they happen, in, let's say, here in California or here in the U.S.? Yeah. It's because, you know, European consumers are more set in their own ways mm -hmm. and more conservative. Right. Th th it's much harder to convert a European on a different approach to coffee than it's harder than, a, than an American or a Canadian or an Asian person. Yeah. 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 And that's that definitely is intricately connected with the fact that uh, especially the Southern Europeans, as you mentioned them, are very hard to convert. The Italians still believe that they are that they discovered coffee, that they uh -huh. invented and reinvented coffee altogether, uh -huh. right? Yeah, even and, though, and even though there's you roast, know, I think, yeah. or something, right? <laughs> I mean, there's not, you don't get much variety when you're over there. Exactly. But that I've seen, yeah, maybe it's yeah, again, yeah. yeah. But but now to come to the story of yeah. my Your Turkish, anecdote, okay, at least there is so. something about Turkey. Okay, <laughs> yeah. But, so when I, uh, I was 19 years old, okay. and I uh, had the plan to travel to Turkey. Okay. And I decided to, to, Travel to Turkey on my own to hitchhike most of the journey there. Oh, nice! And my my dad advised me, you know, <laughs> when you're going to Turkey, you have to take coffee with you. Okay. And I asked him, coffee, you know, roasted coffee? No, no, green coffee. You have to pack green coffee in your backpack, and you will find out you can make the biggest friends with that coffee in Turkey. Okay. And so I packed like one or two kilos of um, green coffee beans. Which is perfect if you're hitchhiking. Yeah, It's perfect exactly. to carry a couple of kilos of coffee yeah. with you when you're hitchhiking. Yeah. But yeah, okay. <laughs> so you packed it. And I packed it. And, you know, 10 days later, I hitchhiked to Greece and then took some small boats, saw some old friends that I had met before, um, and then took a small boat to Turkey and was had been spending my money way too quickly was getting very low on cash. Uh -huh. And then I found and discovered the yeah, the amazing power of green <laughs> coffee beans okay. in Turkey that was had been going through a major economic crisis. They had had just a military coup the year before. Well, they used to have them every 10 years. So yeah. Yeah, and uh -huh. and they um did not have any coffee at that time it okay. was very hard to find any coffee whatsoever ah, in turkey at that point because there was no money for um imports, imports no yeah. currency yeah and so so i remember my the first half of my stash i traded it with an uh, innkeeper like someone where i was spending you know where where i was spending the nights and yeah. and, and i got meals and lodging all for free just yeah. for for Some a little bit of coffee yeah, yeah. And then later on, traveling deeper into Turkey, uh, also that coffee came to great, great use. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting because, uh, because you said they were just beans. So they were, they were just unroasted beans. And so, so, and so they, they were, were able to roast them. Th somehow. They were roasting them on a, you know, similar to how the Ethiopians do it on a skillet on fire. Really? Okay. Then, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah. 
And could they use those kind of beans to make Turkish coffee? Of course, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Turkish uh, coffee is the same beans, it's just processed a different way. It's, you know, you roast them maybe a little bit darker than you would do for drip. Yeah. But then you grind them extremely fine. And yeah. So, so you need a mortar for yeah. that or a very special mill. Yeah. And they, they of course, had those. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. So who knew? Who yeah. knew? You don't need money. You didn't need money back then to travel in Turkey. You just needed coffee beans. Okay. So let's change the subject. Um, actually, maybe it's not such a big change because we're going to talk about economics now. And okay. so actually, maybe that was a nice segue. Um, in your talk with Dave Eggers, you referred to coffee as being, and I think this is more or less a quote, coffee at the crossroads of socioeconomic and commercial trade. So what did you mean by that? So coffee, of course, as a product being grown in tropical and subtropical countries, by default, coffee is grown in countries that um, that can be many of those countries can be considered third world countries right 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 and the coffee cherry grows on the coffee tree and coffee trees in major parts of the world grow in uh, mountainous areas where where harvesting has to be done by by hands yep and by the manual labor mm -hmm. right so so coffee by itself, by default, is a product that is being touched by thousands and thousands and thousands, or we can say millions of hands million. every year, right? Yeah. That little cup that I just served you has been touched by potentially, you know, hundred different hands. Did they wash their right? hands? Do we know that they wash their hands? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> did it, it tasted okay. Did it taste clean? It tasted clean. <laughs> yeah. It tasted. I feel yeah. safe. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, a lot um, of people. So, a lot of people actually come in. Into and so. The, yeah. So in order to enjoy your cup of coffee at $2, $3, $4 per beverage, um, in order to make that possible, the labor that is used for that has to be, you know, has to be available, has to be right there. Right. And so the unfortunate part is, and this is now where I come to the, you know, why is it at the crossroads of economic and social, cultural um elements in countries is because you know coffee uh, is picked by all these people that are not always paid in a fair manner for the work that they're doing they're not paid always unfortunately to the level where they can sustain themselves for the longer time ahead right and, and that's a very um sour or bitter element of coffee is that it's specialty coffee or commercial coffee they're being produced by people who often cannot make ends meet. So poverty and coffee, poverty and specialty coffee, unfortunately, are often interconnected. So I want to read a quote that may or may not be from you okay. because it's from your blog. Yeah. And as I learned, not all your blogs are actually from you. But this, this sounds like exactly what you just said. So I'm feeling safer. And there's no okay. Turkish intro to this one. So, quote, deep. I mean, I think again, I think it's a quote. Deep in the south of Mexico is the beautiful state of Chiapas a well-known origin of specialty beans. In Chiapas, two of the most important coffee municipalities display the highest level of poverty amongst farmers. Motocintla and Chilon are the most productive municipalities in this state. In Motocintla, 81.3% of coffee farmers, and this is back from 2016, by the way, but 81.3% of coffee farmers live in poverty, and in Chilon, the statistic tops, tops at 95.3%. Uh, and then, I don't know if this was the same post or different post, but also from 2016. And this is, this is relative to fair trade. So this was really interesting to me. During the past 20 years, certifications like Fair Trade Organic and Rainforest Alliance became widely accepted models to address the plight of coffee farmers around the world. Now it seems as if the earned premiums for quality and for social sustainability never had their intended impact. Something is fundamentally wrong with the business model of our specialty coffee industry. So I was really surprised. So that goes specific to, yep. to the point you just made. Totally, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, that could be a whole other show, kind of what went wrong with fair trade. But at the same time, you also said at Dave's talk, at your talk with Dave Eggers, specialty coffee, and this was obviously just three weeks ago, specialty coffee breaks the chain of poverty that has existed for centuries. So it seems as if even though maybe fair trade didn't work out quite the way we wanted it to, you're still optimistic about the potential for coffee to have a, a really beneficial impact. So where's yeah. kind of, what's your so, so high the, level view of all yeah. that? Cause so there's a the, lot going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And so obviously this, the world of coffee is very complex 
we now have um, thousands and thousands of small roasters, medium-sized roasters, and some bigger roasters here in the U.S. Yep. And uh, fortunately, as part of the specialty coffee tourist wave, there are many coffee entrepreneurs who really try to break that traditional model of poverty and the production of coffee. And they do this by creating a re reward system, either by buying from the, from the right importers or by establishing their own uh, lines of connection with growers. And they will reward growers for the effort they make, right? Mm -hmm. This is at least there for many of them is their intention. Unfortunately, the way coffee is being traded has not significantly changed over the last 40 years. So from the first wave of coffee or specialty coffee, while well, specialty coffee develops, the traders have not necessarily changed significantly. Mm -hmm. Still, 60% um, of the coffee that is traded in the world is traded by big international conglomerates right. that, that are not necessarily interested in uh, aspects like tr transparency and fair trade and, and all of those important elements. It's just so the bottom line. Yep. It's bottom line. So specialty coffee traded, bought by small roasters using direct relationships. Those types of relationships are usually the best way to get small farmers out of their cycle of poverty. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but by percentage, we're still talking about a very small percentage of the coffees that are being consumed in the world. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and it's mostly these kind of smaller organizations or, or entities like the ones we were talking about who are really taking the time and making the effort. That's where you're going to get those, those sorts yep. of. Yeah. Yep. So should we still buy fair trade? Or is yeah. it really more about finding these kind of places that you know have these sorts of relationships? You know, I, I think fair trade as a model is still is is a, is a solid model. Yeah. Um, not necessarily do the revenues, the monetary revenues, come back to the farmers, but as a result of the fair trade model, farmers typically are helped to organize through cooperatives that offer some s form of support for farmers by having joint infrastructure. They might not have otherwise, uh, and that might that they might not have otherwise. Okay. Yeah. All right. So last thing I want to ask about um, about the economics is because I just thought this was really interesting, too. So I think Blue Bottle had a sixteen dollar cup of coffee and you made the point again in your talk that, you know, people balk at that sort of price. I mean, I would balk at that sort of price. And yet you also made the point that people don't balk at that sort of price for wine. So is that unfair? Should coffee and wine actually be sort of I mean, it seems as if as much care and attention and complexity goes into the production of coffee that it does wine. So what are your thoughts on the on the comparison between the two? So, you know, the the evolution of wine is tremendous, right? Over the last 20 plus years, we've seen Napa Valley growing up as uh, as a, you know, as a as a beautiful example of how wine can be crafted and how diverse and differentiated it can be catering to consumers in so many ways. Right. And so coffee is just where wine was, I would say, 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah. And so can coffee be like wine? Absolutely. It's like the abundance of flavors in coffee, um, in my opinion, as a coffee professional, go far beyond the flavors that we find in wine. Oh, beyond uh, even. Beyond. Oh, he's, yeah. he's challenging the yeah. wine industry. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. We're going to bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring it on Napa Valley. Yeah. Willem Boot is ready to take you, take you on. And he's just Absolutely. down the street. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And so, Interesting. so I think the future for coffee in terms of the, I would say the culinary um, benefits of coffee, you know, it's, amazing flavors is um is, is that that is a future that's very promising okay. i feel yeah all right and so paying for you know a cup of coffee way more than you were you're used to you know, think back of those days when you were still chugging you know uh, a wine, wine from a curtain oh, right i never was yeah, no, maybe you were but, i never was but, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i trust you yeah. yeah no but but i had you know but i did used to pay a dollar for coffee yeah and was fine with that yep. you know and there was a transition to paying 350 but yep. the reason i transitioned was because i could very clearly tell that the quality was better 
Yep. And so that's the thing, right? I think that if, if I drink a cup of $16 coffee and I'm like, wow, this is unquestionably that much better, I'm not going to do it every day, but I will do it with a clear conscience and feel good about it because I know, oh, this, there were a lot of love and work and whatever went into this. And so to me, that's the whole thing is if you prove the value like so many of these roasters around here have, where I don't think twice about paying 350 for my coffee. I might regret it when I go back to my bank account after a month of doing that twice a day. But, um, but yeah, if you can tell the quality, then I think people are willing to do that. Right. Okay. I have so many more questions along those lines, but we're already so far behind, which I'm usually really good about keeping us on track, but this is all just too interesting, but I want to talk more about you specifically and boot coffee specifically. Yep. Um, cause we could spend hours just talking about coffee in general, but I want to, um, I want to find out more about boot coffee. So tell me when, why, and how you started it. So my brother and I were running a coffee roasting company in Holland. That was kind of the continuation of my father's brands yeah. in Holland. We started a completely new company, wholesaling coffee, using the same philosophy as I our dad had um, developed. And and during the these years doing this with my brother, we started to develop with the help of our parents who were at that point kind of semi-retired. We started to develop direct relationships with farmers in countries like Panama and Colombia and also, uh, interestingly, uh, interestingly enough, in Thailand. Okay. Um, and I became so intrigued by seeing and tasting the impact of the small farmers specializing in producing quality. And I was so intrigued by that, by the aspect that you as an individual or as a roaster that you could that you could actually influence that that you could potentially work with these farmers in order to create something that was unique right yeah from a culinary perspective and from a, from a flavor perspective and that in that way you could maybe even potentially in, impact their lives right so it could be a win-win yeah and so during my hi high school years i was quite active in like a, in holland in a chain of stores that was completely non-for-profit selling merchandise from developing countries and so i had kind of that mindset all, all all those years and then going back coming here to the u.s in 98 was for me was a real um yeah i saw that as an opportunity to develop a business catering to these specialty companies that were now in their fast moving second wave of uh, evolution and i first thought you know i'm going to share my expertise as a roaster uh with these all these yeah um, new companies right and and that very well became very quickly became also a, a consultancy business a consulting business also providing you know expertise with these companies about my 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 know-how as a um, coffee blender and taster and then it also helped that i had been trained as an economist right and um, so in um, around the turn of the millennium <laughs> i uh that sounds like that sounds just that wow sounds, yeah <laughs> that sounds like wow we're so getting really ago. historic here yeah, <laughs> so, like, yeah. Um, so around the year 2000 i yeah. that was an interesting kind of a phase in my development as a consultant I got this call from someone from DC mm -hmm. and this was by a person who worked for the world's second largest um, international development bank mm -hmm. the Inter-American Development Bank yep. and they were looking for an answer on the uh, massive crisis in the coffee world uh -huh. and so that's how I became a consultant for this massive investment development bank in helping them figure out how the crisis of coffee had been um, uh, yeah taking shape and you resolved that crisis and and i completely <laughs> resolved that yeah, yeah and, that, and your trajectory yeah. was launched um but then fast forward so that's 2000 fast forward to 2016 you up op, you open up your which is just two years ago or a year and a half you open up your boot coffee campus yes yeah, so NFL. i started to develop to do these courses yeah. initially in my smaller home studio type of um, I think coffee it was in studio. a garage is what I read. In front of my house. Yeah. Uh -huh. Beautiful, beautiful building, garage. Beautiful garage. Uh -huh. But that's, 
started to expand to the level that the uh, neighborhood literally kicked me out. Oh, then, seriously? <laughs> they, they were, they, was, they were like, you can't do this here anymore. The, the traffic became <laughs> just too much. And okay. the uh, officials, uh, the county officials, they told me, didn't you know that you have to do these types All of these things with a permit? And, 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 right. Oh, and yeah. that's how we got to open Boots Coffee Campus. Because you were booted out of your own place. We were booted out of my own place. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, all right, uh, so you've kind of touched on this, but but so I want to talk about what you offer yeah. at Boot Coffee. Yeah, so so we, you've got consulting, yeah. courses, and trips. So tell me a little bit more about the consulting that you do today. Yeah, so of very specifically, the consulting is for entrepreneurs who um, have a coffee business or who, who are starting a coffee business who want to expand, okay. who want to find a certain niche in this uh, market. And for those companies... We develop uh, roasting profiles. Uh, we help them find the right beans, like single origin beans produced by often the same cons uh, clients that we consult with in producing countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, we give them business advice also on how to you know do things right to stand out. Yeah. Um, well, and that was going to be my question is. If you were starting today, how would you stand out? And I think you've just answered it. It's the it's the bean, it's the relationship, it's coming up with your own blend that really is distinctive. It's those kinds of things. So, so I I think you should try to at least create one coffee or one part of your portfolio should be created around a coffee that you as an entrepreneur personally start developing right by by creating a personal relationship with a producer mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. the producer is in uh, mexico which is very close by yes or, in, or just in, down south yeah, it's yeah just down south or central america south america or maybe you have an opportunity to travel to like kenya or to ethiopia and by doing that you create as a coffee professional you you create a unique signature with under those products that will help you to stand out from yeah. from the others, it will help you also to create uh, a unique set of uh, yeah marketing stories that that can give you the edge, right? Right, and that's yeah. what it's all about, right? Yeah. Is the edge. Okay, um, tell me about your courses because you have a few different types of courses, and the first one is sensory skills. So, what are sensory skills as they apply to coffee? So, in order to as a coffee professional, in order to know what you need to buy and in order to evaluate how good of a job you did as a roaster, in order to do that well, you need to be also a proficient taster. You okay. need to, with some level of confidence, you must be able to say as a coffee professional, as a coffee business owner, that yeah, yes, this flavor, that's what I want to go after. This represents my philosophy. This represents my brand, right? Yeah. Yep. And in order to do that, um, we teach this course, which is basic, basically part of a um, certification course. Mm -hmm. And the sensory skills um, track helps you not just by tasting coffees, but also by tasting other products. Oh, really? Uh, like we, we, we have other products like... Uh, sometimes we find ourselves tasting like licorice or oh. we we taste uh, wine or we taste chocolate. Yeah. Um, and by doing that, you develop a frame of reference and criteria on how to judge those products. Well, and that was also one of my questions is, are people, are certain people just more naturally predisposed? Are they better tasters? Do we just have better... In their minds, yes. <laughs> in their minds, in their yes. Minds. But in practice... Not no, necessarily. We've all got what it takes and we just yeah, need but, some training. But sometimes a student comes to me and takes me aside and tells me, boy, I had not realized how hard this is. I'm not go never going to learn this. And really? they, they become, well, they ex express their their fears of never being able to do this. They just, you know, just crumble mentally, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. And we have to literally make them aware of the fact that tasting starts in your head yeah right and it also starts with the level of confidence that you develop about your ability to being able to differentiate between uh your uh, your your coffee from ethiopia or your coffee from colombia and can't we all taste right right is i don't know anyone 
unless they have some 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 Ailment physical or something I- limitation impairments, right? Yeah, yeah. But I do not know anyone that cannot taste the difference between, let's say, a, a dark lager beer and a and a light beer okay or somewhere that cannot taste the difference between uh oatmeal and uh mushy right <laughs> so you know so right. we all can taste right we all can taste but and we're just we're, we're running over on time i'm just gonna say this anyway not everyone can taste the difference between a nutty floral fruity because we're not just talking yeah. about that coffee tastes good and, or and bad so that's exactly what we do in the sensory skills just get them there. class yeah, we gradually get get them there. We give okay. them this confidence that yeah. they can very gradually learn how to discern. Are there any hallucinogens involved in this training to help um, convince them? To help we, get them we, there? we don't <laughs> we don't need those. We don't, don't need, need that. Those. Okay, because you're good enough. All right, yeah. roasting foundations. So this is another. So roasting foundations course. is obviously is all about coffee roasting. Right. That's a course that helps uh, that introduces coffee roasters candidate coffee roasters to the art and skill and science of coffee roasting. And at a very high level, just what are, for people, again, for the lay person, what are some of the basic premises of roasting? So without roasting, you cannot create coffee, right? Right. So you have to roast the bean. The bean is green. It's the seed of this cherry that is taken out after various steps of processing. And then you have to roast it. If you don't roast it, if you don't put it through this intricate process, then there's no way that by grinding and extracting it that you can extract the unique flavors of how we know coffee. Right. And so roasting is of the essence, and there are various ways on how to do that. Mm -hmm. The protocols used in that roasting process, that's what we we teach our students. And we have uh, yeah, probably the country's... Um, yeah, most unique collection of coffee roasting devices to help people you know, become confident as a coffee roasting professional. And so having no idea, but I'm going to just guess, I'm guessing that like temperature, duration of how long you actually roast, and it sounds like the, di- the different machines you use also produce different sorts of results. So there are just lots of factors. Yeah. What yeah. Are, are there any other? And, you know, there's... There are some newer technologies that allow you to vary the pressure of the roasting machine. Okay. Um, and then in the newest technologies, in terms of data gathering, you can see through an interface directly to to a cloud-driven technology, you can see immediately what's happening in your roasting. Of course you can. Yeah. Of and so, of you course, can. you know, it's Cloud-driven like, coffee yeah. roasting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. It's just crazy what technology can do. I mean, that's great. That's but, great. But, but essentially, just... as I always, if someone asks me, so what makes me a great roaster? Right. And, you know, then I, my shortest summary is, it, is you will be a great roaster once you start reading the beans. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Reading the beans means that you're really extracting both through a scientific as well as through this art-driven uh, approach that you start to um, extract the information from the roasted beans or from the beans while they're being roasted. Yeah. Because isn't that a really key point is that in spite of or in addition to all the science and all the technology, it's still an art. Yeah, I would, s- I there's would say. Still, there's I, still I, a, a part I, where... I, I, I'm always wary when I see a young new coffee roasting professional when i just see him or her stare at the numbers on a computer screen and i i often try to challenge them and ask them hey when is the last time you actually smelled this coffee being roasted right right when did you try to taste the bean that just came out of the roasting machine what did you taste and why right okay i have a few one-off questions so you also have barista courses yeah which we're going to kind of gloss over uh, unless there's something in particular you'd like to say about those. The, those courses help um, a barista to yeah, really uh, excel at what he or she wants to do. And so it gives you not only the technical framework, but also the, yeah, I would say the mindset to be successful in that in that job. Baristas are usually underpaid, and this helps them to, to get ready for a career that can uh, very likely also give the justification for a business owner to 
you know, to maybe raise the price of the drink a little bit in order to um, to pay the barista a fair uh, salary. Okay. Uh, so selfishly, the reason we're kind of glossing over the barista stuff is because I have some questions that I would want to I have wanted to ask a barista. So it's just some one-off questions that I'm going to ask you. Okay. So I'm, I'm ready. All right. Are you ready? Okay. First off, do you teach people in your barista program how to make those little designs with the milk? Yes, we do. <laughs> yes. Okay. Where and when did that, that's all the rage, right? You don't go to a, especially a coffee place and not get the design. And sometimes yeah. they're just over the top and it can be really beautiful. So where did that come from? So there's if a, we know, do there's we even a, know? Yeah. There's a friend of mine, an old business friend by the name of David Schomer. Okay. And he is a coffee entrepreneur from Seattle. He was a machinist, like someone that makes uh, machines and systems around those by profession. And he, reinvented espresso here in the u.s uh -huh. to the level that the italians even started to listen to him okay. and he in his shop started to do the rosettas and the unique uh patterns yeah and and that is really remarkable because the italians of course want to make you believe that they all invented that but as right. far as i know he was the the pioneer <coughs> in this okay and where where is he where did he start in seattle this? in seattle, seattle all right yeah. so that makes sense yeah why do we tap the milk before putting it into the espresso drink? So when you foam the milk, you can have bubbles, the development of bubbles. And the bubbles, these micro bubbles, their pattern can disturb your ability as a barista to be able to make a, a beautiful rosetta or an uh, So they thing. get in the way. The bubbles yeah. get in the way. Yeah. So you want the bubbles to... To basically, you want the bubbles to go away. If you do a great job as a barista in foaming your milk, then you don't need to oh. necessarily do this. Oh, so yeah. if they're tapping their milk, it shows that they have it a little, could, le little to it learn. It could show that they are trying to. They need a mask. remedial boot course. <laughs> yes, and they need a boot course in uh, barista, yep. being a barista. What about the lemon rind? Speaking of Italians, they used to always serve espresso with a lemon rind. It seems like the lemon rind has vanished. What yep. happened to the lemon rind? Because the lemon served to mask the intense bitterness <gasps> of a badly prepared espresso ah, or, or an espresso see, that was I'm glad I asked. created using just bad coffee. Interesting. Yeah. So it was, it was to, to counteract that bitterness. Yep. Interesting. Okay, that's, that's cool. I thought it was, I don't know, more than that. Okay, the last one-off question I'm going to ask is a more recent trend all of a sudden, my macchiato, which is what I normally get, has been started. It's being served now with um, sparkling water. Why is that? I think that's just, you know, one barista. No, it's happened at a few places. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's part of a new trend. It's just a thing. Yeah, it's okay. part of a new trend. So that one's less interesting yeah. than a lemon, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, in 2006, you realized a dream. What was that dream that you realized in 2006? Yeah, so... That actually started in 2004, oh, right? So okay. in 2004, I tasted for the first time in my life, I tasted at a coffee tasting event in Panama, I tasted this geisha coffee. That yep. was the first time this variety <laughs> was being introduced. And it's a, it's a Arabica uh, coffee variety from the Arabica species. And when I um, thought of, uh, when I think back of that event, then it was for me, it was like, it was a revelation. I think you I, said it turned your world upside yeah, down. So how did a cup down. of coffee turn your world yeah. upside down? Because I did not realize how beautiful the flavor of coffee could be until that moment. Okay, so it was and that much better. It was that much it was that like distinctive. and unequivocally the best I had ever tasted And you can tell he's life. still in love with it. Yeah. He's still in love and with so, it. And so and that <laughs> set my, my mind on the idea to not only find the, the source of that geisha in Ethiopia, but also to start actively explore the possibility of start to grow this on my own. Uh -huh. and so I bought some land and in 2006, we actually started to develop uh, a coffee farm called La Mula, the mm -hmm. mule. Yes. And um, that's on the slopes of the Volcan Baru. It's a volcano in Panama, 3,500 meter high volcano. And that's where um, La Which Mula is over was 10,000 feet. So it's way that's, up there. Yep. It's like yep. 11,000 feet yep. or something. Yep. Yep. 
And that was, you know, that was a dream I had expressed uh, many years, many, many years before uh, I had expressed elements of that dream. Yeah. That maybe in some part of my life I, I can become a coffee farmer. Yeah. So why grow Ethiopian coffee in Panama? Why not? Because now you also have a farm. You're you're involved in a farm, part owner, or at least involved in a in a farm in Ethiopia. Yeah. yeah. Why take the Ethiopian coffee, uh, the Ethiopian coffee to Panama? What were the advantages there, or is it just closer? No. So you know the 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 geisha variety was first discovered. The flavor potential was first discovered in Panama. And and we we all feel that the Panamanian conditions are very um, uh, are very suitable for this variety. But it is from Ethiopia. It's originally from they Ethiopia. Just, they 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 started roasting it and figured it out in Panama. So Correct. Is, is the, okay. But but the 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 all Arabica coffee varieties are from Ethiopia originally. Yeah. 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 The geisha had been taken relatively late in the 1930s it had been taken mm. from ethiopia and um at that time first it, it was being distributed amongst research stations throughout the world in two or three different waves mm -hmm. um and then the variety that's grown in panama was taken from in the 1950s from africa to costa rica they are grown as an um, experimental variety in a large experimental farm. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 1960s, it was taken from Costa Rica to Panama. Okay. Yeah. So, so it gets around. So coffee varieties, for the sake of you know economic development, also are taken around all the time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. So one of the other things you do at Boot Coffee that I didn't mention or I just maybe mentioned really quickly in passing are trips so you yep. take people on trips and one of the trips you do is in fact to this uh, farm that we've one of the farms we've been referring to in Ethiopia you also do ones to Panama but um, you d you have a trip that you were going to do actually next week that got canceled because of what's going on in Ethiopia right now um, and that's a Gisha Gisha okay so wait Gesha is the village but Gisha is the coffee is that right yeah there's Gesha. I couldn't figure out if that was a typo, or but I think the, Gesh is the village, Gish yeah. is the coffee, and but there's the, something more there. It looks th like there is yeah. a <laughs> there is a there has been some some controversy. Oh, okay. The okay. word Gesha. Yeah. Okay, but at some point, the word Gesha evolved into Geisha, okay. and and it's not clear who did that. It might just um, be a transliteration. Very likely. Um, it was already started uh, by the consul general, Mr. Wally, <laughs> who was in the 1930s involved in his first expedition. Mr. And, Wally. and he already, in his letters that he was writing to his um, superiors, he was already writing Geisha instead of Gesha. See, that's the right? thing. It sounds like it's just a transliteration or not that's even what transliteration, but just, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the reason I brought up the trips, one is just so people know about yeah. the trips, but two also because you did something really interesting around in this area where you take people around this farm, which is you wanted to find the roots of Gesha, Gisha, whatever kind of coffee we're talking about. So why was it so, what does that mean to find the roots of this coffee? Because we just got done talking about how it was taken from Africa and then it traveled the world before settling finally in Panama. Um, but why, and you became obsessed with this coffee, you know, why find I, the roots and what does that mean? Because I, I wanted to understand and I wanted to discover whether this coffee was still around, growing wild. In right? the wild. Yeah. Right. right. And um, because it had been in the 1930s that uh, Mr. Wally had been <laughs> uh, extracting that coffee or seeds from, from Gesha types. And uh, he had been basically pioneering this. And so I thought, well, despite all the deforestation that Ethiopia has had, maybe it's still around. And that became a, yeah, a center, a, a focus of mine. And so we started to travel to all these different communities with the name Gesha or Getcha or Gisha in it. And um, around the same time, I met Adam and Rachel, who had aspirations to become farmers themselves, coffee farmers. And we kind of serendipitously joined on this quest to uh -huh. find the orange, uh, or origin of uh, Gesha coffee. Did you find it? And and we we feel Think that we did, did find yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, by encountering like a small forest, a 200, 300 hectare forest called the Gore Gesha Forest. 
and by tasting the coffee is growing in that forest and by then doing um, um, genetic research yeah. with those seeds we were able to establish with a high level of certainty the fact that the coffee that it. is now growing in Panama and in some other places around the world was originally from that forest from that forest yeah cool is that forest yeah. protected now it is it is very well protected by the local um, people that that live there because they are still also um, using that forest as a um, common place to gather coffee cherries doing the same thing that they have been doing for the last hundreds of years okay. most likely great okay why is it called cherries versus berries because most people i think in common parlance we would refer to coffee berries or i don't know but it, they're called cherries do we yeah. know why no, um, that's just a random question I, I, it's, it's 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 i didn't realize that until today yeah more as semantics element okay i think cherries is also because cherries typically have a seed and berries okay. don't necessarily have a singular oh, larger true. okay uh, stone fruit type of seeds. Okay, so that's, see, that's why that, the experts that might here. Be, yeah. That's a good answer. Okay. Let's talk about the art. So we've kind of talked about the art and the science. Let's talk a little bit more about the art. I guess this is actually both. This is going to be the art and the science still, but the production process. So at a high level, can you take me through the entire coffee production chain? Now I know you can because you've documented on your business card, the whole production chain is on your business card. So I know that's a big question, but I also know that you can do it pretty succinctly. So at wow. a high level, what's yeah. that look like? So high level, it, um, not having to sp spend various days here, right? Right, which I would love, but yeah, yeah well, we'll have to I, do a series. <laughs> yeah, we would have to do a series. But when you process coffee, there are various choices you can make how you're going to extract the seed, which is ultimately the coffee bean from that cherry. Yeah, and so the simplest way to do it is to do this in the way that it was done uh, hundreds of years ago, is by harvesting the ripe cherry and to dry the cherry on drying beds and then by at the end of the drying cycle then extracting the dried s seed the coffee bean from the cherry that's the simplest way right requires least equipment uh, but it takes a bit of um, meticulous handling and um, selective uh, harvesting and having the right equipment to then uh, remove the dried skin right so that's that's option one the natural style mm -hmm. option two is you do it in the so-called washed process mm -hmm. so now instead of immediately drying the cherry now you harvest it you deep pulp it with a machine that looks like a big food processor okay and then you take the skin off the pulp off and then you dry what's called the parchment bean mm -hmm. and then in the end of that process the wash process is this the maceration thing this has That's nothing different. to do nothing with, to do. Yes, okay. with maceration right. yeah, yeah. and <laughs> never mind and yeah. so then before you then export you ship the coffee you take the final skin off and so that then the recipient the importer or the roaster can do his work yeah yeah, yeah. okay and then there's various in between hybrid forms of uh, processing yeah that's are nowadays being explored tremendously like the maceration washed and the carbolic maceration and you know there's yeah. double fermentation and there's a lot of uh, interesting ways that coffee uh, producers are now looking at ways to yeah to do it better cleaner and to create unique flavors right okay so again so much more that we could talk about there yeah. but another key thing is it's based around a spoon <clears throat> excuse me that you carry with you everywhere you go what's the deal with this spoon that you carry with you everywhere did so you, bring you know it I, I i sometimes jokingly say and i think i did that in the in the with dave eggers yeah. uh, presentation you know i i jokingly say you know the spoon has seen more than i would ever <laughs> tell my mother or my right. wife right yeah. right right but you know the spoon the tasting spoon for a coffee professional is a is a very important instrument because that's the tool that we use to actually, you know, ultimately slurp the coffee and, and to do cupping. our tasting. And that's cupping, right? right? Right. And so, and and so the spoon, in my opinion, is a very important uh, tool. You have, I have kind of a personal relationship <laughs> with my spoon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's definitely a different episode. But um, but tell us what. So you said in 2014, cupping is the only way to find out whether the roasting is done properly. 
Uh, if it's a light roast or a dark roast, the coffee needs to be cupped to ensure that the profile is still valid. How? Tell us just quickly how you cup. So you've got your spoon, but what are we doing with the spoon? So it's before the spoon even comes into play. Yeah, you first start smelling the uh, coffee that is being infused, and now you have ground coffee. You smell actually, actually the first the uh, aromatics of the ground before coffee before it's brewed. We're talking before about. it's brewed, right? Then you start adding some water. Now the infusion process starts, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And that takes three to four minutes. And then, then finally the spoon comes to play, okay. right? And now <laughs> with your spoon, you open up the crust that Ooh. has formed on top of this liquid, yeah. right? Yeah. And now what happens is that under that crust, a lot of the aromas, they start to gather and they... They're yeah. trapped. Come out. It's like, so you like gotta an, set them free. Like a genie out of the bottle. <laughs> there are the aromas, okay. right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you have already smelled the what we call the dry fragrance, the aroma of the ground coffee. Right. But now you, you smell the aromatics of the coffee being brewed. Right. And so the there are certain molecules that are much more vo volatile than the molecules that are not coming out when the coffee is just dry. Uh -huh. So when you add hot water, some of these volatile molecules give you extra information about the aromatics. Right, right. right. So then we get the cup ready for tasting. Yeah. We remove all the remnants of the ground coffee and of the um, oils that float on top, the lipids. And again, this is what we're using the spoon for? We can use a spoon, the spoon <laughs> for that. Uh -huh. And then... We start tasting. Oh. So then you you very carefully, you fill your spoon, not too full so that you don't make a mess. Right. But now you have your spoon with a relatively hot coffee that has a temperature of anywhere between 120 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. 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 And in order now to <laughs> aerate that coffee while it enters I your know mouth. What's coming. I know. What's, I right. witnessed this and it was, now, it was powerful. You... <laughs> You slurp, right? Okay, and every taster has his or her own you know, hallmark signature <laughs> sounds for the tasting. Yeah, and yours yeah. was pretty powerful. <laughs> yours was, I mean, you when you slurp, you're not messing around. I you mean, know, I had to put my earplugs uh, in. It got pretty intense. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that might be an exaggeration. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm not known for that. Yeah. Um, okay. You say, though, that you there are days when you taste hundreds of coffees. Yeah. So how do you actually keep your palate still able to to function it? Yeah, know? so you so your palate by itself doesn't get tired, okay. but it's your your mind. Again, it comes back and to the mind. Is, and this yeah. is where you 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 take all these impressions, these aroma and flavor impressions. Your mind processes it, right? The aromas in your limbic system, the all the tastes in your cerebral cortex, they together those two parts of your brain start to um, communicate together. And that makes you, after tasting many coffees, that makes you truly tired. Yeah, right? yeah, um, I would think so. And your mouth still wants to continue what your brains tell you. Mm, maybe right. not. Pasta. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I won't, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I want to give one example. We talked about some of the, the similarities and parallels between coffee and wine. And, and one of the descriptions that I read preparing for today of your La Mula coffee just illustrates this perfectly. And I didn't have it in my notes before to read, but now I do. So, uh, and this was from Coffee Review. And this was, I guess, I don't know if this is a magazine or it's an awards body yep. of some sort or both maybe. But Coffee Review provided the following flavor description of your La Mula coffee. Quote, immense, sweet, juicy, intricate, lilac and jasmine, peach, apricot, rose hip, much more in aroma and cup. A vibrant but unobtrusive acidity shimmers in the heart of the sweetness. Mouthfeel is satiny, full, almost nectar-like. Flavor, particularly the crisper notes, carries deep into a sweet, peachy finish. So, I mean, again, that's over the top. And it shows, like we were talking about earlier, you know, you said, well, everyone can taste. Well, not everyone can taste to that level. So, um, and again, that could be a description of a wine. I mean, yeah. as far as the, the, the complexity and the of the author of that, of that flavor impression... Uh, Ken Davids is is a master not only in tasting but also in the language to describe it. Yeah. Well, that was another thing is that yeah. there, there's a whole there is a whole language a yeah. whole lexicon 
yep. related to to how yep. this is it's fascinating. And, fascinating and he i remember he compared that specific coffee that he was reviewing then to the impact that certain you know drugs can have through hal hallucinations <laughs> and i found that wow i find that quite remarkable oh, it sounds like and you did a good job yeah you know it's like it sounds like yeah some something went well there. something went yeah. well and it went yeah. so well that that coffee was actually taken out of competition you were expelled from the comp just like you were expelled from your garage in mill valley <laughs> or wherever i think it was mill valley wherever in marin you were expelled from this uh coffee review awards because the coffee left the judges dazzled and your farm was expelled from their competition yep which is a great thing yep and that coffee, by the way, can be found at lamulacoffee.com. So uh, get it. Get it because it's, I mean, it's too good for competition, which is amazing. All right. Um, we talked about, so we're totally over on time, but there are a couple more things we have to talk about. So um, since you're basically captive here, I'm just going to ask you. We talked about the socioeconomic issues related to coffee, including how it can benefit um, communities and so you have a project in southern Ethiopia that is doing a lot of good. So I wanted you to tell us a little bit about that. So that's um, a program that started uh, more than ten years ago. Actually, the founders of that program met each other in the waiting for their coffee at a Pete's. Oh, seriously? At a local Pete's <laughs> at a Pete's in Mill Valley. That's awesome. And Sagaya Bekele, who um, was born in Ethiopia. He was born in the town of Aleta Wondo. He moved to the U.S. in the 1970s, later in the 70s, and then stayed for more than 30 years in the U.S., didn't travel back to Ethiopia because he, he kind of fled Ethiopia because of the communist Marxist regime at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. and, and he and the other founder, Donna Silan, who is a public health expert, and they joined forces and around the same time that's when i met them as well and sigaya felt the need to go back to his home country and he went back to aleta wondo which is in the sidama district of um, ethiopia and and found his birthplace aleta wondo to be in you know in uh, great despair poverty um major major crisis healthcare crisis lots of uh, unnecessary deaths people you know just dying because of um, waterborne diseases like mm -hmm. dengue and malaria and of course a huge impact of uh, aids and uh, just you know misery in his Across hometown the board, right? right in his hometown right, right. and and he felt the need to start to give back mm -hmm. and that's how the um, common river foundation was born okay. and common river is a u.s based foundation and with common river we set up a school in uh, aleta wondo a primary school uh, with five grades since the inception of the school uh, we have had more than um, 1800 kids coming through our school graduating oh, wow. through our school We've had um, also through an evening school we started for young women. We've had, had hundreds of uh, young women come through our program. And we also provide um, kind of a nutritional program to the kids by giving them one really healthy lunch per day. Oh, wow. And, and that helps them, you know, to make a tremendous um, or we see tremendous impact of what we do oh, I'm not sure. only because of the education but also because the of the nutritional programs oh so, yeah, yeah. Uh, is there a website for that because I forgot yeah, to look that one up common commonriver.org commonriver.org common common. yeah okay the other program I want to quickly if you could quickly touch on because this one's super interesting as well the Ethiopian wild forest coffee program yeah so Ethiopia still harbors um, many patches of prime forest where coffee or has been originating for thousands of like years virgin forest right. the virgin forest been, yeah. yeah and coffee has been growing there as long as you know we know yeah and three years ago we were approached by um, a group financed by the uk government to help them understand the population of these wild forests coffee um, communities and communities that were still in process of um, gathering and uh, trading wild forest coffees and mm. we so 
we have been involved in a initiative to basically create a um, yeah a map of these origins mm -hmm. to taste these coffees and to also to gather the socio economic data of these communities mm -hmm. and um, that's that we developed a report about that and that now led to a new program for which I was able just able to get funding uh -huh. um, to do this same project but then in a more profound way in the west of Ethiopia okay where you know coffee was born in Ethiopia but it was born in the west of Ethiopia really in the west uh -huh. and so uh -huh. we we can now uh, do this work and uh, this important work in the west of Ethiopia to basically create an uh, yeah an index of the areas where the wild forests are and to gather uh, to create a database by tasting these coffees and also by gathering the data of those areas. And then I've been able to get the funding also to build in a, in a certain percentage of those communities, small micro mills, small, small basically very small processing mills <coughs> where these coffees can be um, uh, produced so that the locals can get a new source of income out of them. Right. So it sounds like that's one point is to yeah. help the locals to, to be able to derive more income from that. Is the other to make sure that just the knowledge is not lost and that these these native places yeah. where the, that they're and, still... Or, or the, it's not just the knowledge. It's also the... The uh, actual the, plants, the actual, the actual forests the, the, and the, the environment. Genetic material. Right. 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 And so these genotypes of coffees... You know, that's part of a, uh, yeah, a, a heritage. It's like it, w w that must be preserved. Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's talk quickly about the future. And a little while ago, you said something about, I can't remember, you touched on, on your thoughts about the future. Oh, I think that was in the context of our wine versus coffee discussion. And you were saying that, you know, you saw, you were saying that coffee is where wine was 20 years ago. Um, but are there trends that you're seeing today that might offer us some insight into where you think coffee might be headed? Specialty coffee in particular, yeah, I think, or even in general, but but specialty coffee in particular, perhaps. Yeah, so I think the uh, the economic challenges of producers, um, I expect that those economic challenges will not, uh, yeah, go become away. A, they will not go away, but I expect that consumers will become more and more aware through the influence of the third wave um, coffee entrepreneurs of today. They will become more and more aware of the necessity to be able to you know pay. A little bit extra for their cup of coffee, specifically to buy the coffees from those roasters, retailers who truly are involved in, initi in initiatives working together with these producers, with right? The producers, yeah. So that consumers take more interest in uh, in traceable coffees, coffees of which you can tell where they are from and who is behind it. So right. I, I think that will continue because. We also, as consumers, we care more and more about, you know, where our bread comes from or our cheese or, you know, or the, the, the leather of the shoes that we wear. We want to... These are vegan. ...often know where they're yeah. from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are vegan just by chance. I ended up with vegan shoes. Uh, do you know where the leather came on those? Yeah, those, this leather came from the southeastern corner of Calabria. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In Holland, yeah. we never bullshit. Uh, okay, uh, you, uh, you said that earlier. You're proving your point. Okay, what about just quickly, because again, yet another topic that could be a whole episode, but climate change. I mean, we're talking about agriculture. Yeah, so, that's, so that's the second piece of the future of coffee is um, becoming uh, yeah, more and more, uh, to give it a positive spin, yeah. becoming more and more interesting because of <laughs> Climate change. <laughs> Maybe is, you do bullshit once in a while. But yeah. Climate change uh -huh. is not going to make the job of coffee farmers easier, but it will require them to really think of how to grow that coffee best, right? Yeah. And um, so knowing that coffee does not just grow by itself effortlessly yep. and that there are certain diseases that can come as a result of climate change will yeah, have to make coffee farmers, um, I would say, yeah, re-engaged with their with their with their work it will yeah. keep them on their toes yeah. um so i actually had a question while we were talking okay. you might have seen me typing uh which ordinarily i don't do and i almost hit the wrong button when i was typing which reminded me why i shouldn't type well besides the fact that it's rude um sherry is asking you and then we're going to wrap up here very quickly but she wants to know what does you what does he recommend you being he to get the best cup of home brewed coffee she's ready to graduate from her keurig 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> I welcome that. He, well, like, yes, her evolution. Know, yeah. The 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 best place for your Keurig machine is the trash can. Oh no, <laughs> the recycling. Yeah, or the recycling trash can. <laughs> um, so it starts with buying uh, a decent hand grinder. Okay. Or an electric grinder, but hand grinders nowadays um, are made in all types of shapes and and price classes. So so buy a hand grinder that uh, will give you. Uh, freshly ground coffee and, and why 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 hand grinder versus um automatic yeah that, like uh, you know like oh, that's what you mean just one that like does an it electric with... grinder oh, okay so right. when you say hand you don't mean not electric I, actually a hand grinder yeah okay yeah. so that's what i'm so, so that's what i'm asking why, so, why hand versus electric because you can take your hand grinder anywhere like i <laughs> i travel with my <laughs> coffee kits all okay. around the world i know right yeah yeah and so the electric grinder, the cheaper electric grinder has a rotating blade that is okay to use, but the hand grinder is better because it crushes the beans in, instead of pulverizing them as okay. a blade okay. grinder does. So it's actually a question of yeah. quality yeah. in addition so, so, to portability. And it's a good way to give that those arms a little bit of an exercise, <laughs> a free exercise, right? Okay, yeah, amazing yeah. forearms. <laughs> Look right here, amazing forearms. Yeah. Okay, and then what? You get uh, your own grinder. So you get your own hand. grinder. Yeah. Then... I would recommend to buy one of the best American invented and made products in the history of coffee, which is the which Chemex. Is the, the Chemex. I don't yeah. even know what that is. C-H-E-M-E-X. Yeah. And it's an interesting carafe-looking contraption, uh -huh. which you can buy nowadays in any um, store that has kitchen apparel, etc. Right. And the Chemex has a really cool filter that you uh, fold and then with your freshly ground coffee and your hot water, your hot, clean water, uh -huh. you now prepare your own special brew. Wow. And that, that takes only five, six minutes out of the day to, to do that. It's maybe, worth it. maybe a little bit more, but it's, it's, it is really great. Okay. It is really great. Is there a specific temperature? So you can, you could, and this is fun to explore at home yeah. to, brew coffee anywhere between um the with a water temperature uh, with water boiled up to 180 up to 200 or 205 okay and you will find that the different temperature of water extracts the coffee in a different way okay yeah and then do That's this amazing. brewing process in three to five minutes max okay and also keep track of your time Doing that, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it will allow actually, you actually yeah. log it so you can yeah. see what's what, what and, you like and, best. Uh, you know, don't have to log it, but you know, just keep. Well, an how are you going to keep track? Watch. Just That's keep an what eye on your watch. Yeah. Just have your just have your computer there and log it on Excel, and then compare and make charts and graphs, and then you'll end up with the perfect home brewed coffee for the for the real precise mathematicians, coffee brewers. That would be the right <laughs> way for for the artists. They. They just use you know their watch. Or, okay. All right. Whatever works for you. Um, upcoming things that you've got going on upcoming. I was just going to tell people to check your website for your schedule of upcoming courses and trips yep. is, would you recommend anything else? Is that, uh, anything in particular that's coming up or is it all on the website and that's yeah, the we, best place? We're preparing actually, um, a new release of our online courses. Uh, uh -huh. So, and that's a, through a, our website, which you can find under coffeecourses.com. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, and so we currently, we, we still actually have a, uh, I think it's still up. It's like a, a Black Friday special oh. for the coffeecourses.com. Okay. Yeah. Black Sunday. And, and it's. And Black Monday. Yeah. If Black they, if Sunday, they rush. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take it down. Yeah. We, we will keep it up. Give them another few yeah. hours. Okay, um, coffeecourses.com. Coffeecourses.com. And this okay. is where you can actually learn the skills and the theory of roasting and tasting and what makes a great coffee great. Yep. Um, and there, there's a, it's basically a library of videos and instructional materials that help someone who is at home to become, uh, to basically start this amazing track. The of best becoming barista a coffee in their neighborhood. Yeah. The best barista in their yeah. neighborhood. Okay. So I'm going to throw out some links. So bootcoffee.com. That's your main website, I think, Correct. right? And then we've got lamulacoffee.com. Lamula is just like it sounds, L-A-M-U-L-A. -A. Uh, and then what was the other organization we mentioned earlier? Commonriver.org. Commonriver.org. And is that the sort of thing where people can send in donations and yep. things? Yeah. Yeah. So 
And then the last one is coffeecourses.com. Correct. Are those all our URLs? Yep. Did we cover them all? Yeah. All right, Willem, this was so much fun. This was very interesting. And like you said, we could have talked for so much longer. We're already at an hour and a half, so we've got to wrap it up now. Uh, but thank you so much for coming in today and sharing so much about coffee and about your endeavors. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Great. Uh, again, I, I am honored. It is, yeah. <laughs> I'm more honored. Yeah. But all right. I'm glad that we're, both, that we're both feeling good about this. So thank you very much again for coming thank in today. You. Thank you. All right. That is all for today, unfortunately. Next week, like I said, it's all about Morocco. Aaron Byrne and Doug Cordell will be on the show to talk about our books and upcoming event, All About Morocco. Again, Corte Madera, December 7th. Uh, Corte Madera Book Passage, December 7th. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you liked the show, please share on social media and subscribe, rate, and review on YouTube, iTunes, and or Google Play. That is the only way the word gets out, and I really appreciate your help. For more about me, my website is matthewfelix.com and links to my social media, books, including my new one, Porcelain Travels, other podcasts, and all the rest can be found there. If you have any comments, ideas for the show, or just want to say hello, I would love to hear from you at felixonair at matthewfelix.com. Thanks again for watching and listening. And uh, now please go buy some specialty coffee. Please go buy my new book and have a great week.